Let's resume. Uh, I want to make a, a correction, and that is when I was talking about dose dumping, I referenced a medicine that was withdrawn from the market. I, I said it was hydrocodone. It was a hydromorphone preparation, not a hydrocodone. So just to, to clarify that before we go. The other, the other thing to say is um, <clears throat> during the break, I was talking with one of you about you know just a, a general approach uh, with patients with pain. And to, to implement the CDC guidelines, I think it's, it's very helpful to have a talk with patients to instruct them that the treatment of chronic pain is not a passive process. I think that what we've done in this, uh, you know, taking a pill for everything culture is we've transformed a lot of chronic illnesses into simply taking a medication and things will be okay. The treatment of chronic pain, like the, like the treatment of addiction or the treatment of depression, for example, is something that takes a lot of work on the, on the part of, of the patients. It's an active process and they have to be participatory. That kind of buying is necessary before you're gonna be able to convince them to take, for them to take their time on some of these non-pharmacologic interventions, which can take uh, an investment, certainly of time, effort, uh, and sometimes money because uh, insurance companies uh, don't cover all of those things that I listed on that slide uh, as far as effective non-pharmacologic interventions. But let's, um, let's go on. So we, we've, we've covered identification, we've covered initiation, and now we're gonna go to maintenance uh, of patients on chronic opioid uh, treatment. Uh, another reference slide for you uh, for links to different kinds of instruments that can be used to monitor how well patients are doing uh, with their pain. At every visit, of course, it's important to evaluate how well the opioids are doing their job and then also to evaluate for uh, the adverse events. And so we're gonna talk about some ways to do that and use some, some specific tools that are more unique to the patients who are taking opioids as opposed to other medications. So we're gonna talk about um, prescribing monitoring programs uh, and we're gonna go into some depth on urine drug testing because I think that there is uh, a lot we can learn from urine drug testing, but there's some, there are some limits as to what urine drug testing can, can tell us. And I think in, in a lot of venues, uh, it can get over, over interpreted uh, and patients can suffer uh, consequences uh, as a result of that. Let's first though take the situation where you uh, you don't have access to pharmacogenomic testing and so you've tried your first opioid and one of two things happens. One is that there's an adverse effect. Uh, let's say someone just gets nausea and vomiting and with repeated doses they just they can't tolerate that or let's say it doesn't really work. And, and so they come to you and they say, this, this didn't do a thing for me. Now, sometimes we look at those patients as if they were drug seekers. Uh, you know, especially the red flag goes up when the patient says, you know, the only thing that works for me is morphine. You know, don't give me my, my, my paradigm because it always makes me nauseated. Well, you know, that it could be drug seeking. You know, it also could be true. Uh, the, there is a, uh, a lot of work that's been done on the characterization of mu opioid receptors, finding that there's a lot of inter-individual variation in all of us, meaning that really there are some people who are more, uh, let's say, let's say you are a hydrocodone person, let's say I'm a fentanyl person, uh, that will respond better, or with respect to adverse effects, that we have differential responses uh, with respect to, to nausea and vomiting, or the itching, or the myocalls, for example. And so in this case, it may be appropriate to change drugs. Well, how do you do that safely? The first step is to go to an equianalgesic dose table. Uh, you can find these in textbooks, you can find them all over the internet. The important thing to say about them is that they are always the first place to start, but they are never the last place to end. Uh, when you're finally making that dose calculation. So here's a very simplified example of an equi-analgesic equi dose table. And you can see four very common medicines and uh, in, that, in that highlighted part of the slide, the oral doses of medicines which are considered to be, uh, that have analgesic equivalency. 
And so you, if you were going to go from morphine, let's say, to hydrocodone, it might be easy because it's just a one-to-one -one dose change. But there's another caveat that you need to add to that before you make your final calculation. So first you do the math and make the calculation, and then you do this. Automatically, that dose gets, gets decreased to either 25 or 50%, depending on the risk category. Now this isn't an addiction risk category, this is more of an overdose risk category. So if you look at the 50% people over there on the left, you see that what unifies them as uh, that they may be a patient population that has some inefficiencies in the metabolism of drugs. They may have chronic liver or kidney disease, for example, or they simply may be older, and as we age, we're like moving targets. Our, our metabolic machinery becomes less and less efficient uh, with time, they would that you would take your calculated dose and you cut it in half, and that's where you'd start. If those situations aren't present, they would then you'd have people over in the 25 percent. But as you can see, regardless of the category, it's a non-trivial reduction in dose. And then there's the fine print on this slide, which with respect to methadone down at the bottom box, there the categories aren't 25 and 50; they're 75. And 90. Methadone is a, you know, it's a very nice drug for, for some reasons. One is it's dirt cheap. Uh, there's a lot of clinical experience with methadone. Uh, it has no active metabolites, so you really just have to worry about the parent compound and how long it's going to stick around. But along with its good side, there's some other sides that you have to be aware of before you prescribe the drug. One is even though that the parent compound is all you have to worry about, there's a wide variance in some literature too, from 13 up to over 100 hours for a, for a half-life. You know when there's that wide a variance, there's a lot of individual variation. And you're never sure at the first time what, where your patient lies in that. And so on initial doses, it's gotta be cut right, right, way back for safety purposes. The people that have been running opioid treatment programs have known this for a long time because regardless of you know, how much heroin or whatever drug the person is taking to come into a methadone program, the most you start with is generally 30 milligrams in a given day and no more than 40. Now this is for a population whose target dose is generally between 80 and 120 milligrams a day. And that's because methadone induces its own metabolism. So as lower doses are given, the enzyme system gets revved up to be able to handle the higher doses, but if a, quote, therapeutic equivalent dose is given to an individual right off the bat, there is the potential for overdose. So this uh, start low and go slow is a great idea when we're, when we're, talking, about, uh, when we're talking about using a methadone. It can be very, very nice drug, but it's, but it's a bit tricky. If you've never prescribed methadone before, I suggest uh, that you know you get a mentor or someone who has just to, to, to review your patient with you because it can be a little difficult to, to have your first person uh, on methadone. The, um, the, the QTC prolongation has nothing to do with the mu opioid receptor. Uh, however, the effect or the risk for it is dose related. So as you get to higher doses with, with methadone, you should be checking uh, QTC uh, intervals to make sure that you aren't putting that person in that risk for fatal cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, there are some um, drugs that you may not find uh, on the, uh, in a equianalgesic table in a textbook or, a, uh, uh, <clears throat> or, a, uh, or on the internet. But in the package insert, you can find the, uh, the equivalent doses and that would function as your table. There are some patients that, that uh, like, like, let's say Norma, let's say Norma starts out and uh, her pain is really the worst in the evening. And during the day, let's say you have tried duloxetine and, it, and she does just fine with that up until the end of the day when she's been very active and now you know, her knees are just killing her. Uh, an, in, an immediate release opioid is perfect for that situation. Now, as the disease progresses, Norma may come to you and say that 
those, that, that pain is happening earlier and earlier in the day to the point of where really the pain now is disabling all day long. And you're dosing her with multiple doses of immediate release opioids. And she doesn't really like having to take pills uh, that often. And you're thinking, maybe I'd get by with a lower total daily dose and more steady plasma levels if I would switch from a, to an extended release or a long acting drug. And so that would be the a one scenario where that would be appropriate. Uh, extended release long acting are always uh, uh, preceded by a trial on an, on an immediate release uh, medication. Now, whether you're going to go from immediate release to another immediate release, but especially to immediate release to an extended release, long-acting release, you would come to definition number two of opioid tolerance that I talked to you about. This is the definition that they're talking about on the package inserts. It's very technical and specific, and it means this slide. It's patients who have taken the equivalence of 60 milligrams of oral morphine a day for a week or longer. If they have done that, they are considered opioid tolerant for the purpose of this definition. Uh, and as you can see, there's a variety of equivalents, but it's only necessary to really memorize one and then know where you can look up, up the rest of them. The reason for that is that as you look at a lot of um, opioid, uh, <clears throat> opioid package inserts, you're gonna see dosing intervals, and you're gonna see those intervals that are appropriate for people who are non-tolerant, and then you're gonna see another group for people who are tolerant, and this is the tolerance that they're talking about there. There, there, there are two extended release preparations that have no indication if someone is not opioid tolerant and should only be given when they are, and those two are the fentanyl patch, and the extended release hydromorphone. Um, again, there, are, there is no non-tolerant dosage that, that are recommended. They must be opioid tolerant to get that. <clears throat> In switching from an immediate release to an extended release or a long-acting drug, uh, the medicine is going to be hanging around longer, and so there can be some subtle changes. So backing off from using that calculation is an important thing, even when, even when uh, using the same drug. Although at low doses, it, 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 it's not as big of a deal as changing drugs, but it's always something that should be in the back of your mind because the, the drug is now being delivered in a different manner than it was with an immediate release. And then if we follow Norma through her through her, uh, uh, you know, through her disease, and she, you pick an extended release opioid to carry her through the day, and now her disease is getting worse, and she's having some some times where the pain is just not being covered uh, by the extended release, but it's not all the time, and so you treat her some, with something for breakthrough pain. So you pick a immediate release drug, and the, I think the nicest thing on this slide is there's actually a recommendation how you would calculate that. Five to 15 percent of that total daily dose, that can be incorporated as a starting point in the immediate release drug to give to give Norma uh, some relief during those times when she needs it most. Extended release long-acting opioids um, should not be given as the first drugs uh, to start people off uh, with chronic pain. And they should also not be used to treat breakthrough pain. How many of you have, have tried some of these um, abuse of turn opioids as well, prescribing them to, to patients? There's a, there's a bit of a mixed track record uh, on, on these medicines, but you should know about them and you know, what the intent was and what's happened with them. So there's a, there's a list of FDA-approved abuse of turn opioids. With these medicines, the FDA has looked at the medicine itself and, and approved that it was safe and effective for certain indications. And then separately, they look at the abuse deterrent part of it to determine that it is, does what it's supposed to do, and that is discourages inappropriate administration of the medicine. So we can look at two major classes of abuse deterrent opioids. One is when a uh, 
a, an opioid antagonist is mixed with the agonist. And so we have one example here now. Uh, some of these, there have been more, but some of them pulled off the market. But this one still exists, the Inveda formulation. And, and, and how this works is, now Trexone is in beads that, that are, are released if the patient decides they're gonna chew the drug to, um, to turn it deliberately into an immediate release uh, kind of medicine. And then, it's, then when it's swallowed, the naltrexone will get absorbed and will attenuate the effect of the morphine. Uh, if the drug is taken as appropriate, then those beads are not compromised and they just go right through and only the morphine is absorbed. So that, that's one way to do it. More commonly, we have more examples of altering the matrix uh, that, that, that the drug is embedded in. And so we have a few here, the, the, the first one being the OxyContin formulation of extended release oxycodone. And so on the, on the left-hand side, in the upper right there, you see old OxyContin. And if you, if you crushed it up, you have a very nice white powder. This could be used intranasally uh, or intravenously uh, when dissolved, and, and, and people were getting a a bolus of the entire dose of the OxyContin right away instead of over the several hour release period that it was supposed to happen. Because of overdose deaths in 2010, the new formulation came out. As you can see, it looks quite different. So if you try to crush that up, what you get are these coarse granules. It actually is uncomfortable to snort those. Uh, and if water is added to this mixture, it turns into a jelly-like goo which, which uh, is difficult, if not impossible, to inject. And, and so that was the, uh, that was the notion, uh, to, to make it more likely that people would use these drugs as they were, as they were prescribed. And you know, when we did, you know, you're doing outcome studies, that's what it showed, is that um, there was less inappropriate administration of OxyContin in the new formulation than there was in the old formulation. But there were some other things that happened too. And that is that uh, in survey data, in poison control uh, data, uh, in a variety of studies, the same thing happened, is that there was a dislike that grew from the new OxyContin formulation, but there was a switch to other medications and so, Immediate release uh, abuse of oxy oxycodone increased, but even more worrisome, as you can see by this graph, heroin use increased as a substitute. And so there's a, you know, the, I, the, the drugs seemed to do what they were intended, but there was an unintended consequence uh, as a result. There also was another um, probably expected consequence, and that is users uh, figure their way around uh, some of these deterrents. I, <clears throat> I, I was interviewing patients, uh, trying to figure out if they were, were some of them, and I admitted one once, and he told me, yeah, I, it used to be uh, you know, very off-putting, but all it takes is a little bit of citric acid, and it turns that jello uh, into a nice fluid, and I could inject it without any problem at all. So, and, and, I'm, and that's all over the, the, the internet. So there, that was another, besides changing the heroin, people figured out how to, how to um, beat uh, the abuse deterrents. So they're out there, the, the, the results are mixed, uh, but, that's, uh, but I want you to be aware of them. Prescription monitoring programs. We still have one state in the union that doesn't have one, uh, although it has partial ones because some counties are, in Missouri are taking initiatives and creating their own and they're communicating with each other. So around some of the large cities like St. Louis and Kansas City, they've got, they've got quite a bit of information that's circulating, but not a, state, uh, a statewide prescription monitoring program. In Tennessee, um, these are your details of your prescription monitoring programs. There are, there are states writing it into legislation now in Illinois. Uh, we, we have to consult our prescription monitoring program. Uh, there are, um, <clears throat> the other thing that's happened is that states are becoming um, more willing to share their data with outside states. When it's first started in Illinois, uh, 
we only live 40 miles from Indiana, and so we had people that were going across the state line, and there was no way to get access to them. But many states are, are getting reciprocal arrangements with other states, and Tennessee is one of them, in fact. Uh, there's quite a lengthy list here of all the states for which you can get data through arrangements that have been made. Each one of these has to be done state by state, though. One of the, um, one of the recommendations or initiatives in the, in the White House's um, addiction plan was to, was to really more federalize in, in, uh, the prescription monitoring program. That hasn't happened yet. It's, it seems to be happening more in a piecemeal way, but it's very tedious for every state will have to make those arrangements with every other state. Urine drug testing. Urine drug testing is, uh, I, I think that the way you should think about it is it is like any other lab test. And put no more stigma or significance to it than you would a CBC or a comprehensive metabolic profile. Once you think of it as a lab test, then the, the question of how often it should be done simply becomes, will the information I get give me any kind of information that will make me uh, either uh, change what I do or will it give me reinforcement uh, as to what I'm doing is the correct, correct path. So just like any lab mm -hmm. test, which if the information causes some kind of a change, then you would want to get it. Uh, looking at urinary drug te urine drug tests like that can remove a lot of the different uh, mysterious part about it, like it sits in a category all of its own. Urine drug testing will only tell you one thing. It will tell you if a drug has been taken by that patient in the recent past. It will never diagnose addiction, diversion, uh, withdrawal, uh, or anything else for that matter. Simply recent exposure. Urine drug testing is done to confirm the presence of drugs that should be there and to also uh, confirm the absence of drugs that should not be there. Any good urine drug test consists of two components. The first is what we call the screen, which is an amino assay procedure. Uh, it can be done as a point of care test with dipsticks uh, right at the office, or it can be sent to an outside lab, and a lot of the good labs now can get you screening results in 24 hours or less. Uh, so it, it, it timed isn't as much of an issue with send outs as, as it once was. But there is a problem with potential false positives with the immunoassay screen. And so if a patient is positive on a screen, what's being done? Uh, what, is, what, what is the next step? One thing that shouldn't be done to people are things that have incredible negative consequences based solely on a screening test, like their kids get taken away, or they go back to prison, or, they, um, or, they, or there's a discussion that maybe they shouldn't be in the practice anymore, or if they're in a treatment center, maybe they get kicked out of the treatment center. That shouldn't happen as a result uh, of a screen. There always needs to be a confirmation. The first confirmation is much less expensive and a lot easier to do than the second type of confirmation. What I do with patients when I get a positive urine drug screen is I show them what the screen says and I tell them, this is unexpected. Do you have an explanation for me? A lot of my patients will tell me, yeah, uh, I did that. That's your confirmation and you don't need to go any further. But there, there are some situations like the, the lady that I was treating uh, for multiple addictions and in her outpatient follow-up, a screen came up, methamphetamine positive. And she swore up and down, I've I not taken any methamphetamine. I have no explanation of how that could even so we went to the confirmation. The confirmation confirmed her story. There was an absence of, of methamphetamine or any other amphetamine for that matter as well. Uh, it turns out what happened is a, is, a, is a not unexpected false positive. She was taking bupropion as prescribed for depression. Bupropion sometimes will show a positive on an amphetamine or a methamphetamine screen. And because of this confirmation test, we proceeded as, you know, as if everything was fine with her recovery, which it was. 
Now, I didn't feel the need to confirm every subsequent a methamphetamine positive screen that, that she had. You would only need to do that if you had some kind of clinical suspicion uh, that, that went with that, and then you might want to do it. Uh, but but that, that is just one example of how a screen just isn't good enough. The other thing that you need to be careful of is when you are doing your drug testing patient with patients with opioids is you know what your tests actually test for. So let's look at the common opiate screen that we have here. This is what's done a lot of times in, in hospital labs, uh, or um, this is what your point of care test would be if it says opiate. And look at this list of drugs, all of which are opioids. Which ones of those can you reliably expect to turn positive on an opiate screen of all that list? All of them? Okay, I've, I've got to vote for all of them. Does everyone agree? Pardon me? Okay, um, so you're saying that not all of them. Are there any on here that you recognize that you think would, that would be detected? Hydrocodone and morphine, I heard. I heard methadone. So here's the, here's the results. The greens are those that you can reliably expect to turn up positive. And so you have morphine codeine and something called 6-monoacetyl morphine, which is the metabolite of heroin, which is tested for. We don't test for heroin specifically. This lasts a little longer. The blue ones that I have are those that sometimes will turn positive. Now look, now Trexel, that's pretty significant, right? Let's say that uh, someone in your practice is, of course, you wouldn't be treating them with chronic opioids. Well, let's just expand this a ways that someone in anybody's practice tested positive for opiates. It might be the naltrexone that they may be taking to treat their opioid use disorder or their alcohol use disorder for that, for that matter. And then hydrocodone will sometimes show up. It depends on the test. A lot of lab screens will show hydrocodone that will show up. The reds, they won't on the screen. You have to test for them specifically. So in a lot of hospital labs, you'll see an opiate screen and then you'll see a separate line for methadone uh, or fentanyl or propoxyphene. Nobody uses that anymore, but it used to be there on the screens. So it's important to know what you're, what you're screening for and the limitations of what this screen will tell you and what it won't. Now fentanyl, the biggest overdose killer right now for opioids, will not show positive on this opiate screen. Okay, so that, if, if the, either, you know, gas chromatography, liquid chromatography to separate the compounds, mass spectrometry to identify them and their metabolites, if that's the chemical part of, of, a, uh, of a urine drug test. The second component, if you can't get an explanation from your patient, this is more expensive than a screen, and that's really the biggest downside to it. Otherwise, there's not a, not a real reason not to do these, um, except for the cost. Typically with a, uh, a, well, always with it, with a confirmation, you will also get a number, uh, a, uh, <clears throat> a levels for, so for example, oxycodone turned up positive here, but you know more than oxy, than that. You know the concentration of the oxycodone in the urine, and in this case, it's metabolite nor oxycodone. And uh, this slide somehow didn't format exactly right, so you can't read anything in that box. Uh, the, the point was in that box, there's a lot of variables in, in a patient that limit your abilities to use that number to draw conclusions. So for example, you can't use the number to say, well, this person isn't taking all of their medicine, they must be diverting part of it because I think their concentration is too low. Uh, because of differences in when a patient may have taken the medication, how they metabolize the medication, 
Uh, and one thing that's really important, hydration status. Where the where body fluids are at as far as how much they're diluted by water and how much, and then that's reflected in the urine, makes a big difference in the concentration of a drug. There are calculations that you can use and the lab will use to correct that for you sometimes, but you need to take that into, into account before over-interpreting uh, the, the numbers. Oh, there it comes. Um, those are the, the, uh, <clears throat> The variables that I was talking about. So let's go to a case, Henry. So Henry's 35 and he had a bad car accident and needed a hip replacement and then he had some infections and so it had to be, uh, he had two revisions and he's had chronic pain ever since that time. Um, he uh, was originally given uh, 80 milligrams of, of oxycodone extended release twice a day but now he's only on 40 milligrams uh, uh, twice a day and he takes an occasional diazepam, whatever that means, uh, but he denies the use of any other drugs. He's coming to you for the first time because uh, he's, he, he's switching primary care providers and his request is, I need a refill of my oxycodone extended release. Would you please give me one? You try to contact uh, his prior physician, you're not able to, um, just because of uh, it's, it's later in the day. Uh, you look at the prescription monitoring program and you find that it's consistent with his story. There aren't early refills or anything else. He's got his diazepam, his oxycodone, there's nothing else and it's all from the same doctor. Um, so you decide you're going to start out with your urine drug test and this is what you get. So I want you to look at that for a minute and answer two questions for me. What is expected and what is unexpected on that urine drug test printout? Now these are confirmed results. We expect oxycodone. We expect oxycodone, do we have it? No. We don't have it, okay. So that's a bit of a surprise, isn't it, okay? We expect more diazepam. Right, we've got uh, diazepam metabolites um, there, and he says he takes diazepam, so we're not surprised to see that that's there. So we expect cocaine. You don't expect cocaine, do we, though? No? Or morphine or codeine. Yeah, um, and then what about the morphine and codeine? Or what about the morphine? And, and that's a, you know, you can't use a number specifically, but that's a pretty high number. In fact, it's so high that they can't even give you an exact number. They just can tell you it's greater than 40,000 nanograms per milliliter. All right, so this is the, the answer when you present them. Do you have an explanation for these results? And no, it's not my urine. But you're an accommodating person. So you say, okay, we'll check again. The first test as you can see, it's dated January 23rd. Now we'll go to the next test, it's February 4th. So what I've done, I've highlighted in yellow the four things that we talked about as far as unexpected and expected, just to give you an idea the, uh, the numbers have fluctuated, but let me ask you this, is there anything fundamentally different in this test result than the last one? Everyone agree with that? The morphine number is lower, but as far as everything, what's there and not there, do you see anything different? Okay, I don't either. So now you have, uh, you have two results now that essentially say the same thing. So he says, Doc, I think I read on the internet somewhere that oxycodone actually gets metabolized to morphine, and I think what you're getting there is just the fact that I, I took my oxycodone and you're, and you're reading it as morphine. In that case, you need access to these kind of metabolic pathways. Not necessary to memorize them in your head, but know where they are in a book so that you can look up and you can find here, and you can ask, question, okay, is that consistent with what your patient has read on the internet? You, you say no, okay. 
No, oxycodone does not get metabolized to morphine. So there's a discrepancy there. So now we have to figure out where could the morphine have come from? And we have you know, some possibilities. Remember I told you that six monoacetylmorphine uh, comes from heroin, but really that doesn't hang around a lot, uh, you know, very long either. And so most of the time when you're dealing with heroin, what you're gonna see is a morphine result. But morphine can also come from other, other places, you know, codeine gets converted to morphine. Um, and, uh, or maybe he was just taking morphine. Response number two, when this one is put in front of him. Okay, I used cocaine twice, once on January 1st, and another time on February 1st. So, is that consistent with the data? Right. Is there a date that does match? The January. What are our test dates that we had? Do you remember? We had a January date, which was twenty third, and we had a February date. It was the fourth. Fourth. So, so the February, yeah, the February one would work, wouldn't it? Because. Cocaine lasts in, in the urine about two to three days. And you're exactly right. If it's high dose, if it's, if it's frequent dosing, it can last more than a week. But that's not what his story is. His story is I did it once on January 1st and once again on February 1st. The urine drug testing does not confirm that story. So there are more questions to ask. And so to, to pull this then all together, Create a scenario for me that is consistent with the data. Why is cocaine updated? <laughs> okay. It puts together the absence of what we think should be there. It puts together the presence of what actually is there. And it also puts together some of the behaviors that you're seeing that are disquieting now as you're trying to decide, are you going to write this person another uh, opioid extended release prescription? Not, he's not taking it to begin with. Okay, he's not taking the oxycodone to begin with. Well, what might he be doing with it? Could be exchanged for cocaine and cocaine and what else? Morphine or, or heroin. He could be exchanging it for both of those drugs. Now, the urine drug test doesn't tell you that. It's consistent with that. It's a hypothesis you can test uh, to, to figure out. So that could be what's going on. What are you going to recommend now that you've, that you've got this data, that you've got his story and the mismatches that are coming up? What are you going to want him to do? Take it, take a risk. It will need to be referred. Pardon me? It will need to be referred to um, an addiction assessment. Yeah, yeah. This person desperately needs an addiction assessment, right? Um, there's enough red flags there for you to say, um, we're not gonna go through with a prescription today and this is what I'd like you to do. And then the decision now is on his side as to how he's going to uh, respond to that. Which brings us back to, um, let's say that this person is in your practice and, and all of a sudden this kind of behavior starts. Or there's a, uh, another patient that's exhibiting aberrant activities. Or even perhaps, if you look at this slide, aberrant behavior is not the only reason why you would want to discontinue opioids. Sometimes people get better. If we go back to Norma, Perhaps if you get a, some short-term control of her pain with opioids, it will allow her to participate in yoga and Tai Chi once again. And now that can be part of her treatment plan and you could reduce the dose of, of opioids and minimize her risk. 
So we have here that, you know, that sometimes what the, the disease is getting better, they don't need opioids anymore, or the opioids aren't working, or they're having intolerable adverse effects, and you can't find an opioid that, that, um, uh, that, that fixes that problem, and so you feel, I gotta get rid of these. What I think happened when the, when the CDC guidelines went out there and people mulled over them and then tried to create policies, is this problem of having doses that may be too high, uh, or even in people that are exhibiting some aberrant behaviors, or for whatever reason that, that, a, that a physician felt that the dose needed to be decreased, was that it got turned into an emergency. And let me tell you, this is not an emergency. Uh, most of the time, it, it is not an emergency. And so you can proceed slowly and very methodically because the last thing that you wanna do is create withdrawal. Because although withdrawal is a normal physiologic response, it is never a desirable response. You can look over a lot of tapering schedules for opioids on the internet and textbooks. The underlying theme in all of them is going slow. And so there isn't any kind of magic dose reduction. To give you an idea how I've done it in my buprenorphine patients, a normal buprenorphine dose uh, in, in a patient is anywhere between you know, 16 to 24 milligrams a day. When I decrease them for people who either want to get off or I'm trying to get to a low dose, two milligrams a month. Because it's, it's just not necessary that it gets done right now. So you can move slowly. Another principle is at the higher doses of opioids, if you decide you need to take for someone, you can do it much more quickly at the higher doses, but as you approach zero is when people become very, very sensitive to dose changes, and so you're gonna to wanna to change the slope of that taper when you do that. Sometimes the taper just doesn't work, no matter how slow that you're trying to go. These are some adjunctive medications that you can use to manage withdrawal to help people through those times if you think that you just can't get anywhere with them and you really do need to get them on a lower dose. So clonidine, for example, that, that's, that really attacks the physiology of withdrawal. Withdrawal is mediated in the locus aurelius and it's, it's with a, a surge of norepinephrine uh, during the withdrawal process. Clonidine puts a lid on that and uh, can help people feel you know, a lot more comfortable. I like using a clonidine patch. Uh, and you can you know, just start at a point one and work your way up with whatever you need, uh, but they keep it on a week and it, it maintains some nice steady levels. Some people will give you know, a pill for some breakthrough withdrawal, just like you're managing pain. It's just, just the other way around, you're managing withdrawal now. The rest of these on here are symptomatic treatments, so the intense myalgias and bonings that people get in opioid withdrawal, nicely treated with non-steroidals. Uh, the watery eyes, runny nose, uh, antihistamines, uh, nausea and vomiting uh, with antiemetics, uh, antidiarrheal agents, and then dicyclamines for the abdominal cramps that people are experiencing. When people are actually being managed for withdrawal in the outpatient setting, you need to see them frequently. So you wanna have contact you know, every few days and be, and be ready that they're gonna call you the very next day uh, for some advice. And some of, this, some of these doses may have to be tweaked over the phone. Sometimes withdrawal or, or the, the taper may go too well. And although I wouldn't say this is a common practice, it's common enough uh, that you should know about it because of the potential lethality. Uh, there, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not in the, people using uh, heroin are very familiar with the use of loperamide to attenuate withdrawal should heroin become unavailable for a short time. Loperamide is generally restricted outside the brain because the, the blood-brain barrier is very effective in keeping it out. But if enough is taken, some will get in and it can attenuate that withdrawal. It's another one of those QTC prolongers though. And since that is not mediated in the brain by mu opioid receptors, it's by a totally different mechanism. Uh, uh, these people are, are at risk for lethal cardiac arrhythmias. 
In fact, it was reported in 2016, I don't know if you follow this news coverage in New York, that pharmacists were, were observing that people were coming in, they were just emptying the shelves of loperamide. At the same time, emergency departments uh, were reporting that there were people coming in uh, in uh, Torsad's VT, uh, some of whom were resuscitated and some who weren't, and we were wondering what the problem was. And this, this created the connection uh, for both of them. They were taking loperamide. So just keep that in the back of your mind uh, as a possibility. This is probably a more likely possibility uh, using uh, kratom. Kratom is a, uh, is an, uh, is a, comes from a plant indigenous to, to Thailand, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a legal product that's sold in, you know, on the internet, and it's in some health food stores, and it can be made into teas or taken by capsules. It is an opioid. It just, it doesn't come from the poppy, uh, but it's still an opioid. It is a new opioid agonist. And so it's not surprising that it has analgesic effects. It's not surprising that it can attenuate withdrawal. Uh, some people are talking about it as being like another buprenorphine and using it to treat opioid use disorder. I don't think it's a, that's a very good idea simply because the half-life of this medicine isn't long enough to, to, to allow for once a day dosing. Uh, in fact, it's not, you can't really think about dosing in those terms because it's not a product that you buy in milligrams, you just buy the powder or you buy the, or you buy the, or you, you, or you, can, you can get a hold of the plant. So uh, some people may have turned to this, you wanna check on that because if they're taking this along with their uh, opioids because they've heard that there's a non-opioid alternative that can help them, they're set up for opioid uh, overdose. And there have been some mixed overdoses that are involving Kratom that are being reported now. So think about that one too, uh, and make sure that you're controlling for that. Consulting a pain uh, specialist, uh, that's what you guys all are. So uh, you know, hopefully the consults will come uh, and they won't just be here, I want you to manage my patient on, on, on opioids. There aren't enough, enough pain specialists obviously to do that but providing primary care referrers with a treatment plan that they can use can be very helpful. Uh, um, <clears throat> education, uh, some of this is gonna be a repeat uh, in, in some of the maintenance, but I think the, this is a, a nice little uh, handout that can be given to patients. Uh, it has some patient-specific things that can be written in as long as there's some very general um, responses to emergencies and then things like you only take the medicine exactly how it's prescribed. And this is free, uh, the US government uh, provides those. Uh, extended release preparations uh, should never be crushed. Uh, they shouldn't be chewed. If people say they can't take pills, there are some extended release opioid preparations that the capsule can be opened and put in um, applesauce or something, and as long as the, as, the, as the little spheres are not compromised, the extended release properties remain. Uh, in a, and so that would be the answer for someone who needs an extended release uh, drug who can't, who can't swallow. You know, I've had, uh, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of stories in my practice, and one of them is, you know, is doc, you know, the fentanyl patch works a lot better if you just put a curling iron on it and heat it up, and boy, you can really get a nice opioid surge. And it does, it works, you know, it, it, that happens. That can also cause a fatal overdose uh, for people. So that's another thing to warn people is not to try little home remedy things to make the drug work better. You know, putting a warm washcloth on it or something. Heat can facilitate the absorption, and that's not a good thing, especially with, uh, with fentanyl. Uh, those that have metal, you know, metal vacuums, you know, that they are a problem with MRIs and they shouldn't uh, be in the MRI scanner. I think that's one of the questions. Um, okay. Naloxone uh, co-prescribing is important, but people also need to understand that naloxone <clears throat> co-prescribing uh, administration in the setting of an overdose isn't enough. They need to call 911. What's the pharmacological reason for that? Why is it important? 
to call 911 and administer naloxone. In other words, why isn't the naloxone administration simply good enough? Half life, right? Okay, so the it, it's more than likely that the that the naloxone will run out of its effect before the opioid that's causing the overdose has run out, and so you'll have a rebound overdose syndrome again. So that's why it's important for these people to not only get the drug but also to get medical attention. Naloxone comes in a variety of formulations. There's a uh, there are generic and there are trade uh, formulations. The, 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 the generic ones have the advantage of a lower cost. The, the trade formulations have the advantage of more ease of administration, such as the intranasal formulations for people who get, uh, just don't want to deal with needles as far as drawing them up uh, and, and then administering it. Uh, the, the, uh, besides the, the nasal spray, there is the the FZO uh, formation, which is an auto injector, so needles are involved, but no one has to see them. And this thing actually talks to you. Um, by the way, just to, you know, I am not recommending any one of these products. Uh, I'm only recommending the drug. So the importance is access to naloxone, not so much which preparation is uh, is better or worse. In in Tennessee, this is how um, the rules are with respect to naloxone. So you have third party uh, access, which means if you write a prescription, you can write a prescription to someone who's not a patient, who's, who doesn't have the use disorder, who's not in chronic pain, for example, uh, because they're gonna be the ones that are administering it anyway. So what, what I do in my treatment center is anyone who has a diagnosis of use disorder, their family and their patient and the patient gets education with, not, with respect to naloxone administration, and then they get uh, either dispense the drug or a prescription written for it so they can they can get it. It's you know for chronic pain it's exactly the same the same principle. Storage. Uh, these medicines are, are dangerous enough they really should be locked up. Uh, it, that's, that's, really, that's not an overreach. Uh, there are um, even if even if you're you're the only person living in your house and you never have, you don't have any friends and no one comes to visit you, there's still a risk for them to disappear. Some of my patients have been uh, people who have service occupations that enter the home and they uh, may be housekeepers, they may be electricians, they may be plumbers, for example. And some of them have told me that that's how they have gotten their opioid supplies. They go through the medicine cabinet while they're in homes and they take opiates and that's how they keep themselves supplied. So even even if you're by yourself, you need to keep these things um, safe. There are pa patients with with uh, with teenagers. There is a um, in some adolescent groups there are parties where people will bring the prescriptions from their home and then they'll take them in a haphazard manner to see what happens. Uh, so it, it the people that may be taking them are a different population than your patients may think of the people that might steal their medications. So keeping them under some kind of lock in a very secure place is not an unreasonable thing. Now how to, once they're done, so, you're, so your patient may be one of the patients who has a surgery and then gets uh, a month of hydrocodone and they only take you know, two or three days of it, what to do with the rest of it? Fortunately, we have you know, a lot of, you know, of, of pharmacies, sometimes in law enforcement, where they'll have you know, just come and bring your medicines in and no questions asked, we'll dispose of them for you. That's the ideal. But if, you, if people are living in a rural area, maybe they don't have that option. Uh, they can be disposed of in the garbage uh, with some kind of noxious substance or some kind of, uh, something that looks like a person doesn't really want to go through, like use coffee grounds, for example. But I'll tell you, if, if, uh, if people, uh, you know, one of my patients, for example, that had opioid use disorder saw that, uh, that would not be a discouragement to go through that bag to get, to get those out. So you'd have to use a lot more coffee grounds that are in the picture. But coffee grounds by itself, when you think about it, it's not that big of a thing. Maybe used kitty litter would be a better uh, thing to, to mix it up with. Uh, 
<clears throat> enough so that the pills can't be seen. There are some medicines uh, that little, it's a, there's a, a little different. Uh, fentanyl, after it has been used for its three-day course, uh, the patch has, still has enough fentanyl in it to kill a small child. So those should be folded and, and flushed down the toilet. Uh, there's another patch, a buprenorphine patch, the butrans patch, which has its own disposal uh, mechanism that comes with it. It comes with a little disposal envelope that you can seal, and then they can be just put out in a regular garbage. But otherwise, what I've said for the other the pills and everything, that applies. And finally, we're going to finish up with opioid use disorder. This is the, the area in which I have lived for most of my career, the intersection of opioids and chronic pain, and then opioid addiction as they all come together in one. Um, either one is hard enough to treat. Putting them both together can be very difficult. Addiction uh, has been defined in a variety of ways, just like pain has been defined uh, in a variety of ways. The official definition as uh, put out by the American Society of Addiction Medicine is over here on the left. And the, 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 wor the focus words here are that it's a brain disease, first of all, and there are characteristic kinds of symptoms. And these symptoms, and I'll go into more of the expanded definition, have, have uh, emotional, physical, uh, and spiritual dimensions. So just like chronic pain, which has that, using that biopsychosocial spiritual model, that same model is used to addiction and it has manifestations in all four of those domains. Now one addiction, one definition that can actually be memorized is that more practical definition if you think of continued use despite negative consequences. So if you ever wonder, why does this person who, who drinks all this alcohol continue to drink and all these bad things have happened to them? Uh, that's addiction. That's the, what's been called the insanity of addiction. People who aren't addicted, who don't have that disease, don't really get it because they don't have that kind of compulsion. But this compulsion can be as, as profound as the patient who told me, my next use was more important to me than my next breath. That, that's where addiction is at the, very, at the very core. But this is my favorite uh, definition for addiction. Certain people use certain substances in certain ways thought at certain times to be unacceptable by certain other people for reasons both certain and uncertain. Looking at that, you can see that addiction is a disease about certain substances on the one hand. So there is a finite group, relatively small group of medications or substances which have the potential to result in the disease of addiction. For example, people do not get addicted to acetaminophen. And then on the other hand, there's a, another minority group, certain, certain people who have a predisposition for the disease. Now that predisposition may be genetic. We know that 50 to 60 percent of addiction is dictated by our genes. The rest of it is environmental. It can be things like a coexisting psychiatric disorder. It can be adverse childhood experiences, severe traumas that occur in childhood, such as the death of a parent, for example, or abuse, whether it be physical abuse or sexual abuse or emotional abuse. Those are become risk factors then for the later development for addiction. And when you have one of those certain people who get exposed to one of those certain substances together, the disease of addiction emerges. You can think of it in terms of an, of an infectious disease paradigm, paradigm where you need a, a virulent agent, you need a susceptible host, but you need the interaction of the two for the actual clinical syndrome to occur. That's like addiction. More formally, the DSM-5 has, has addressed the disease of addiction uh, in a whole section of the group called Substance Use Disorders, and it's, it's criteria-based. And so here we have 11 criteria. 
which are very conveniently divided into three categories. The top being for uh, the physiologic aspects of tolerance and withdrawal, and then we look at loss of control or compulsion to use, and we have some behaviors associated with that, and then we have the negative consequences. And so you can think of physiology, compulsion, and, and, uh, and consequences as three main categories to conceptualize addiction. There's a tweak on here, and you'll see a couple of asterisks in the physiology for tolerance and withdrawal. And here, tolerance, I'm referring to the more wide conceptual definition of tolerance that we talked about at the beginning of the course, not the package insert definition of opioid tolerance. If a person is taking their medicines as prescribed and they experience a withdrawal syndrome or they develop, let's say, analgesic tolerance, that does, they cannot be used as criteria to define addiction. Addiction is really more about behaviors with physiology as, as a part of it, uh, but the physiology all by itself is not sufficient to diagnose uh, addiction. Uh, <clears throat> okay. And so, uh, to, to, uh, to, to say it again in another way, Withdrawal is not addiction, is not physiologic dependence. The, the three have different domains, although there is interaction between all of them. I told you that I would show you that brain slide again uh, at the, uh, that I showed you at the beginning. So here it is blown up with those, those uh, two areas, the periaqueductal gray, but now we're gonna focus on this one, the nucleus accumbens. The way you can think about uh, uh, the core of addiction is something like this. In that area, that circle, there's a group of dopamine-rich neurons, and that area is called the ventral tegmental area, and they project forward into the nucleus accumbens. And when certain behaviors are engaged, or certain chemicals uh, uh, be, get in this area and activate those neurons, dopamine then is released in the nucleus accumbens. The behaviors that I'm talking about are everyday behaviors, such as drinking water when you're very, very thirsty. The good feeling that you get from that is dopamine being released in the nucleus accumbens. And why? Because it's very important to your individual survival for that behavior to be rewarded and to be reinforced. And that's what the nucleus accumbens area does. Or if you're famished and you have a great meal, the good feeling you have that's dopamine in, in your nucleus accumbens. Sexual activity results in dopamine in the nu nu nucleus accumbens as does nurturing activity. So you can see not only individual survival, but species survival is mediated in this very small area of the brain. Essentially that area of the brain has said whatever you've done is a good thing and you need to do it over and over and over and over again. What addictive drugs do is hijack this area of the brain and the dopamine spikes are greater than even the normal of what the area was evolved for. And so you get even a more intense reinforcement. And so that unconscious area of the brain says, whatever that was, you need to do that over and over and over again. That's the core of addiction. Now, it's not as simplistic as that. Because there are projections that go to the prefrontal cortex, the executive center of the brain that dampens some of that well, you know, maybe one drink is okay, but we're not going to go and drink 10 of them tonight. And so some of that feedback comes back to, to, to dampen some of that reinforcement. And so you have this whole addiction circuit. And some people, well, they, they may have uh, some vulnerabilities in that dampening circuit. They may be more impulsive, for example, such as a time in adolescence when that executive function is not fully developed yet. And so young people can become more predisposed to substance use disorders than people with more mature brains. For example, in, with cannabis, anyone under the age of 25 is, is about twice as likely to develop cannabis use disorder as those who have their first use after that. Opioid use disorder then is can be diagnosed with a nice conceptual understanding of what addiction is using the DSM-5 uh, 
to, to number the criteria. And just to get into a little more detail of that, two criteria is considered a mild use disorder, four criteria is considered a moderate use disorder, and six or more criteria is considered a severe use disorder. There are medications that have been FDA approved for the treatment of opioid use disorder. In addition, things like cognitive behavioral therapy and there's, there's a mindfulness um, uh, tract, if you will, that's called mindful, mindfulness-based relapse prevention that also addresses addiction just like it does uh, chronic pain. But the medicines here are those are, I put up here because these are really underutilized in the treatment of opioid addiction today. As you can see at the very top, there's three of them. There's naltrexone, which represents an opioid antagonist approach to treating opioid addiction. Uh, naltrexone comes in two formulations, a pill, uh, which is taken once a day, or an injectable, you may be familiar with it, Vivitrol is the trade name for that, which is an injection that's given once a month. The idea here is it blocks the opioid receptors so that when, when people uh, use opioids after they've used the naltrexone, they don't get the reinforcing effect. And so there's an ex in a gradual extinction of that kind of behavior. But I think there's more to it as well. With alcohol, we know that naltrexone doesn't just do that, but it also decreases cravings before uh, an individual even drinks. And because of where it's working in this nucleus accumbens area, I think that there's reason to believe that that's exactly what it does with opioids too, is that when people are triggered by opioids and this nucleus accumbens area starts to get revved up in anticipation for that, it suppresses that and becomes it less likely that that person will, will be um, a victim of those triggers. And then we have two medicines that are opioid agonists. The first one's been around for a long time, methadone. Methadone, a full agonist. Methadone can only be prescribed, uh, or no, yeah, well, methadone can be prescribed by any provider who has Schedule II authority for, for, to prescribe controlled substances to treat the symptom of pain. It can only be dispensed not prescribed in federally certified opioid treatment programs to treat the disease of addiction. And that's a very important distinction. You do not want to be prescribing methadone in your practices for people with opioid addiction. You can get into trouble with the DFDEA for that. But you can prescribe buprenorphine products in the outpatient setting. In fact, the whole genius for this legislation surrounding buprenorphine was to do just that, really was to bring it in to the primary care and specialist office so that the small proportion of people that they have with opioid use disorder, they could treat them right along with all of their other chronic illnesses. Buprenorphine, however, requires a DEA waiver to prescribe it for the purpose of treating addiction. You can prescribe buprenorphine products to treat the symptom of pain, just like you can methadone, as long as you have Schedule Three prescribing authority. But a waiver is needed. It requires a court. It's an eight-hour course that's taken to get a DEA waiver, and then a person can, a, a physician, nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant can prescribe buprenorphine to treat opioid use disorder. Buprenorphine's partial agonist, so it's a bit safer because the, uh, it has a ceiling effect, especially for respiratory depression, and so you really don't have a big overdose risk in the adult population with buprenorphine unless it's combined with other sedatives. Uh, so that's, that's a, a nice little summary of those three. It's beyond the scope of the course to go through and talk you know, all about buprenorphine and its pharmacology and the legalities that surround it, but just to give you an idea those are the three uh, pharmacologic agents that the FDA has approved to, uh, to use to treat uh, opioid use disorder. And then finally, uh, there are uh, you know, CBT, uh, mindfulness, and other kinds of psychotherapeutic uh, uh, interventions in addition to those medications can be very, very helpful in crafting uh, a nice overall comprehensive uh, addiction program for an individual. 
uh, this slide is worth probably about two hours of discussion. Treating pain in the person who has an opioid use disorder. And given that we don't have that much time, um, it, it, these are probably the most complex of patients. If I'll, let me just separate some major concepts. If, if someone is not in recovery and they need pain control, if they're in the hospital with acute pain, they certainly need their acute pain uh, needs met. But the most important thing they need is treatment afterwards. But there are people who are in recovery who also have acute pain needs. If people are on naltrexone, that poses a little bit of a problem, doesn't it? If they, if they come in uh, in the emergency department, for example. Uh, there are ways to overcome the naltrexone block. It requires higher than normal doses of opioids, and that can pose a risk for relapse. They need careful observation. Consultation with the, the physician who prescribed the naltrexone in the first place would be very helpful. If people are taking methadone or buprenorphine, you, you consider that that is their new baseline. The methadone and buprenorphine they're taking for their opioid use disorder is not going to do anything for their acute pain. So you have to add on top of it. And, and, that, and there are a variety of strategies to do that, but that's the general principle. Again, you're, you have to watch for that overdose threshold very carefully. And this is not someone that you just, you know, write a prescription for some, uh, for, for some opioids and tell them to go home and, and, and manage their own pain. It's, it's much more difficult than that. And finally, cannabinoids. We have, we have three cannabinoids that are approved by the federal government to be prescribed. These are the two oldest, uh, dronabinol and nabilone. Dronabinol is THC, but it's from, a, it's from the lab. It's not derived from the plant, but it's the same chemical as the plant. Nabilone is a pure synthetic cannabinoid. I've listed the FDA approved indications on this slide. The one, um, the, the one that's specific, the, the anorexia indication is specific just to dronabinol. And then the most recent addition was the cannabidiol. This single preparation for those two pediatric refractory seizure disorders that are listed to the right of the slide, um, that is it. That are the, the only indications there. So as far as a big public health impact, that it's not going to have that. But the impact that it does have is that this is a plant-derived product. So this is a first cannabis-derived, direct cannabis-derived product that was approved by the FDA and rescheduled by the DEA from one uh, to five so that it can be uh, prescribed. These are the only cannabinoid products that can be prescribed by, uh, by providers who have scheduled them. The rest of this is all state by state. It doesn't involve prescription. In fact, it depends on what state you live in, what the rules are for how you deal with the so-called medical marijuana. So on this slide, what we have are, are four colors. We have the gray ones, there's nothing going on there with, with medical cannabis. Then we have the dark green. Dark green is recreational and medical. Uh, the next mid green are those that that have you know, really medical marijuana in, in, in most of its forms, but that, that's even overstating it because every state does it a little differently. So for example, West Virginia went with medical marijuana just recently, although the dispensaries haven't come online yet, uh, but there's no smoking marijuana that's covered under that. It has to be, it can be vaped, but it can't be, uh, combustion cannot be a way to deliver the drug. Whereas in my state, Illinois, which will go live January of this year, uh, combustion is, is okay in Illinois. So even within these colors, there's all kinds of variety. The light greens, those are the, um, the CBD preparation only states. And, even, and they have different rules uh, as well. This is an, uh, not a bad resource. This is a, a, a nice uh, compilation of the research up to the time, and as you can see, it's dated 2017, uh, of, of what there is to say about the medical effects of cannabinoids, and it goes through everything. Chapter four focuses on the um, use for medical, other medical diseases, uh, and the, the, 
the synopsis of the chapter is on this slide. So really what it does is it, it takes, there's, there's, four there's four statements with differing levels of evidence. So in the, in the first one, obviously, nausea and vomiting, there's a wealth of information because we have FDA products, after all, uh, for it. If we move next, we have a different level of evidence, uh, quality of evidence, for chronic pain. But there seems to be that finding that's repeated over and over and over. There's some kind of benefit uh, for chronic pain. Below that, we have spasticity in the setting of multiple sclerosis. And that seems to be consistent, too. There's just not as much there as there is for chronic pain. For everything else, inadequate evidence. I'm, I'm not telling you that it doesn't work. It's just that, tech, you know, in the, in the, in the body of literature that, that we, as a, as a group of physicians, say is uh, what we follow, peer-reviewed uh, literature, they don't make the cut. Uh, the other qualifier at the bottom is that the effect is modest. So cannabinoids, although they may eventually find a place uh, for more indications in, in mainstream medicine, uh, they're not going to be a miracle drug uh, for anyone. They're certainly not going to have the same punch into, into pain that opioids have, that, that have been. But maybe they don't have to. Maybe they just have to take a little bit of it. There has been more research published since that book. It's really um, pretty consistent, though, with what I've said. There's more of a reaffirmation of the chronic pain and the spasticity. And so I don't think those two indications are going to go away from us. I think they're going to be further developed. What's going to happen with other diseases is it's hard to say. This concludes my prepared remarks. I thank you so much for your attention this morning. Um, and don't forget, before you go, fill out. Uh, all of this this packet with the quiz and the evaluation and turn it into Melinda. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day.